Hello, and welcome back to another day in the arena. It's me, it's CGB. It's with tremendous pride and pleasure today that I welcome possibly the greatest magic player of all time, Paulo Vitor Dama de Rosa to the dojo. Here to my YouTube channel. And what brings him over into my world, the one in best of one world? Well, he's here to help me get better, and he can help you get better too. We'll get to that. But he is here to show me how I could have played better in a tournament match that I had, uh, I think it was about two months ago. I was playing the Naya Adventure List, and I ran, was running it in the qualifier, the best of three tournament qualifier events that I do on Twitch. And I ran into Mono Red, my nemesis, the rival, and... I lost that match. So I said, how can I make sure something like this doesn't happen again? And I lo went looking for an, a, a far greater mentor than myself. And I found it. I found him on YouTube, in fact. Paulo Vitor Dama de Rosa, the current reigning Magic World Champion, has a YouTube channel. Many of you already subscribed. Uh, in fact, when I did a shout out to him for the Sultai Ultimatum deck that he played, and I mentioned his YouTube channel, so many of you subscribed that he reached out to me to talk about if we could do something together for YouTube. So in case you guys didn't know this already, you are what make this channel great. You guys being willing to go sub to his channel and check out his content is the reason that this collab is happening. But. We'll set that aside for a minute. Focus. I got a, I now have a teacher, a Yoda, somebody to show me exactly what I need to do next time so that I do not fall to Mono Red again. And he can help you learn as well. So please subscribe to Paulo Vito's Dama De Rosa's YouTube channel, PVDDR, and uh, check out these videos. It's not like me. I'm a gameplay. I try to do a certain amount of narrative, showmanship, some entertaining stuff, you know, things like that. And I can't go deep on every line. I can't go deep on every position. I can't go deep on deck building. I have to keep things moving around. We can't let the zoomers get bored. But Paulo, he looks at the game on a whole other level. And if you want to see some really impressive stuff, he his videos just break down all the decisions that go into certain kinds of gameplay, deck building, synergies, and things like that. And you should absolutely, 100%, try to remove distractions and watch a few of these videos because you will learn how to go deeper on magic. I can probably get you to Mythic and show you some cool decks to play along the way. Watching me every day, I bet if you made it a goal to get to Mythic that you could. If you wanted to succeed from there, if you wanted to grow in the competitive scene and start being a competitor in best of three tournaments, this is somebody you can start watching who will help get you the rest of the way and really give you the equipment and the tools and the mental toolbox that you need to continue to succeed. Between his YouTube channel, which is totally free, his articles on Star City Games, uh, he will get you there. But there is another level if you want to fast track that even more. If you follow Paulo Vitor Dama de Rosa, PVDDR, at PVDDR on Twitter, you can DM him there for coaching. If you DM him for coaching, he will do very similar to what he does for me in this video. He will watch your gameplay, he will break it down, and he will uh, help you not just know where you messed up, because I don't know about you, that's always a little bit nerve wracking to have somebody point out where you messed up, but he really comes at it from a place of understanding what we were trying to achieve in this spot and how to find the right play. Because as he puts it, the same play will never come up again. Every game of magic is different, but you can be better equipped to make the right decision next time if you understand why it's the right decision. And I was really impressed with just how far he goes with trying to break that down and give you give in this case me but can be given to you if you go get coaching uh give you the tools that you need to succeed in the future so make sure you follow paulo vitor dama de rosa p v d d r on twitter follow p v d d r on youtube subscribe and watch some of these videos and again thank you so much to everybody who does that you're the reason this collab happened i appreciate it so much it means a lot to me truly uh a starstruck moment to get to 
share share some time with the Magic World Champion. On that note, let's dive in. Let the nonsense begin. And here we go. We're about to dive in, but first it is my great honor to introduce to all of you the one, the only, Paulo Vito Dama de Rosa. Welcome to the show. Say hi. Yeah, hey, hello everybody. It's good to be here. And uh, now we're about to check out this match. I don't know what else to say, but I, I'm talking to the immortal elite spellbinder now. Uh, <laughs> but big time congrats on that card. And, you know, just as we're about to dive in, uh, it's an honor to get to talk to you today. So I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Very happy about the card. <laughs> it's a sweet card. I could talk about the card a lot, but. We better we better we better start the program and give the people what they came for. All right, so we're gonna uh, go through one of your matches, right? It was you were playing the Naya deck, Naya tokens, mm -hmm. uh, and your opponent is playing Mono Red, which you know I've heard is your nemesis. Yes, it is. It uh, is. So we have to we have to see what went wrong here. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wrote down some of the interesting spots uh, that I think it, are worth talking about. Okay. Uh, the first one is. Oh, well, your hand uh, is okay. And then let me let me find. Okay, so this is a spot, right? Uh, this yep. is your turn one. Yep. And I think that's already an interesting spot because you have a couple options, right? You can play one of the tap lands, the field pass or the floor hedron, or you can play the pathway uh, on green and already play something. And I agree with you. You end up playing the pathway on green. And I agree with you that this is uh, what you should do because you just want to unload your hand a little bit. Right, uh, so you want to start playing stuff right now, but I don't agree with your choice of one drops. Okay. Uh, because you you, you made uh, the token, which means that next turn you can only play one spell unless you draw an untapped land. Right, and then that problem is going to repeat for the following turns. So I think the the play here is probably just to play the sentinel because if you play the sentinel here, even if you don't draw an untapped land next turn, uh, you get to you know make a token. And then tap the token to play an agile winkeeper or the other way around. Uh, so playing the sentinel here it gives you an extra mana next turn. And then if you don't draw a land again, you get to play the Luster of Beast, right? Because you have the Sentinel. Which is something that you can still do if you put the Sentinel on turn two. But it, it just makes more sense to play this card on turn one because it gives you an extra mana on turn two. Does that make sense? It does. The only thing I can think of why I did it might be Bone Crusher Giant, and I've just been Bone Crushed too many times. And even then, now I'm like, what was I doing? Because I'd rather they Bone Crush a Sentinel <laughs> than Innkeeper. Yeah, it's not something that you can really dodge. I think, like, if they Bone Crush the Sentinel, that's fine, but they would be able to do that next turn anyway, right? Because imagine next turn, if you don't draw a land, you just have to play the Sentinel, right? Otherwise, you won't be able to play the Strict Beast on turn three. Yeah. Um, so you're not going to be able to dodge this scenario at all. And even if you do draw a land, you might play the floor hero and they'll bone crush your dad, and you still can't play the lost track on turn three. I, the, the only argument that I would give for playing the token is that if you play the token, they might not attack with the Fireblade Charger because they don't want to trade the Charger for the token, which they didn't, right? They didn't attack. Um, and if you play the Sentinel, they'll probably attack and you're not going to block. So you take an extra point of damage. But I think that is minor in the face of just being able to unleash your hand. Basically. Okay. So the, pl playing the Sentinel on turn one means you get a creature for free on turn two. Basically. Okay. All right. So I think I think you should just do that. Uh, you just get your hand into play a little bit more. That's worth more than the one life that you may be safe. Yep. Agreed. Uh, the next interesting play, I think, is uh, this turn when they attack. And you decide to block the 1-1. One, one. I think that this is a play. In the end, what happens is this attack is a little bit weird, right? Because your opponent, well, actually, it's not weird. Uh, but maybe there's something up. Maybe there isn't. It's it's actually a, a, a normal attack here. Uh, but your opponent plays the Rim Rock Knight, mm -hmm. and that actually is not even that bad for you, because you know you traded a mana from them and two cards for two cards, so it's it's roughly the same. Um, you know, half a card or whatever. But the issue here is that by blocking. Uh, even if they don't have anything, you cut yourself the ability to play a low strike piece next turn unless you draw a land. Uh -huh. Right? Because yeah. you need to have two creatures in play to to uh, you know to get the mana to play this this beast if you don't draw a land, obviously. 
so in this spot, I think I would just take the damage. Even though this is normally a trade that you were fine making. Like, I think you're fine making this trade. You find trading the 1-1 for their 1-1. Their 1-1 is better. And you're even fine if they have any follow-up like they did, right? They had Ring Rock Knight. That's fine for you as well. It's not bad. Uh, but I think th this creature being in play here is just worth too much because it adds a mana for the Sentinel. And you need this mana to be able to play this beast if you don't draw land. And even if you do draw land, you would rather have this mana because then you can go Innkeeper plus Beast and you get to draw a card immediately. Yep. Right? Yeah. Uh, but you, you can do that uh, anyway if you if you draw land. Right? Because you get to play the you get to play the Innkeeper, you get to tap the Innkeeper. Yep. So that works anyway. But the scenario where you don't draw land, it kind of averts disaster. Right? To, to not block here. So I think... Uh, you know the way that things happen, it ended up not even being that bad for you, but that was because you drew a land. Right? Uh, but your opponent doesn't even need to have anything in their hand at that point for this to be a bad scenario for you. Even if they just trade with your one one, and you take the damage, like you take one damage, uh, I think that is already bad for you because you don't get to play Love Struck Beast next turn. You don't get to stabilize. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah, I, I regret that one. So, so yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I think the key is that basically you're, you're giving away life points because you want these creatures to be in play because you need the mana to, to start playing the game, basically. Yeah, I, I think that from playing Mono Red, I've been burned so many times. Like, I'm, I'm nervous about my life total almost immediately, if that makes sense. And I, I think that's a tunnel vision. Oh, I mean the thing is that this Mono Red deck, there are Mono Red decks that burn you out a lot. But this current iteration of Monored isn't really like that. Right? They usually only have four burn spells, four burn pressure giants, and that's about it. Right? So they attack in very big chunks. Like they win the game because they have Tor Brands or they have you know Annex with Ember Cleave uh, and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, I wouldn't worry too much about life early on. Uh, it, it does pay off to kill your opponent's stuff, right? Uh, because it makes Ember Cleave harder to cast and it makes Annex smaller. Right, so in this regard, it, it, you want to be trading with their creatures, but in this spot, if they had annex in their hand, they would probably have played annex before combat. Right, it just makes for a better combat for them. Yeah. Um. And the the ember cleave part is regrettable. You would rather that creature not be in play, but I don't think you can really do much about it because you really, in this spot, if you don't draw land here, your next turn is just going to be innkeeper tap land go, which is too bad. I think yes. you can't afford to have that. When you have the ability to to have a great turn with Lustre Peace. Right? So it, it, it worked out because you drew the land and then your play was actually good. But I think your play is like, you know, the other play was good too if you draw land. So your play might be uh, a nine if you draw land and like a three if you don't. Whereas the other play is like an eight if you draw land and a seven if you don't. And we didn't right? have to so risk you, you're, you're we didn't have to risk it. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, there was no need to, to risk that. You, you were fine taking that one damage. And it does mean that Cleave next turn is more likely to come up, but... So here, I think you did pretty well uh, You know, identifying that they don't have threes, no permanence, and you can just block the 2-2, two -two and your beast is, is likely to be fine. Uh, so I, I usually focus on the things that I disagree with. Okay. Um, but so it, whatever I don't mention, I don't know if you want to watch the whole video for people who haven't seen it, but to see how we got here, uh, or if we just want to skip through the parts where there's stuff to talk about. I think that we're okay skipping around, uh, do it uh, as a coaching session would go. They can always go watch the whole video. There'll be a link to it in the description, everybody. Okay. So the next interesting spot is this one. Uh, you know, it's not showing, but your opponents, uh, the Robber of the Rich, the two cards that are there are the are, are Clarion Spirit, and a showdown of the skulls. Right? Yep. So if your opponent gets to attack with the robber, they get to play either of those two cards. Um, this play, I think, it's pretty interesting because normally what would you what you would do is just what you did, right? You you bone crusher the robber before they could attack, and then you cut off all their plays, right? They can't play Ember Cleave anymore, uh, and they can't play you know the showdown or the clarion spirit. Right? But if I'm thinking about what is actually going to happen, I don't really mind. If they play these cards, right? So if they attack and play Ember Cleave, that's actually good for you because you can just kill whatever they would Ember Cleave, um, and then you can play the Gem Razor and attack back the following turn. Um, 
So I think that is not actually a bad spot for you if that happens. Right? Imagine a scenario where you know they, they have, you don't even have to play the gem razor because you, both their creatures would be dead. Okay. Right. So imagine a spot where they attack with robber and knight, and then you block the robber with the love strike beast and the knight with the giant killer. And then what are they really going to do? Right? If they just tap out to play Embercleave, you get to kill the creature that they equip in response, which I assume will be the robber at this point, but maybe it will be the rim. If it's the robber, it's worse for you. If it's the rim right knock, uh, the rim rock knight, it's better for you, right? Because then you keep your creature as well. But imagine a snare like that. They just attack, and then you block, block, and you kill whatever they Embercleave. Then their, their battlefield's empty at this mm -hmm. point, right? You're still at nine life. But you don't even have to kill the, the Embercleave at this point. You can just attack and play Bone Crusher Giant. And then you'll attack for six or seven, depending on what, uh, you know, what, how combat happened. And I think that's just a good spot for you. It's actually a great spot for you, right? Because they'll be at 11 or 10, and you have more than 10 power in play with still the, the Gem Razor and Giant Killers left in your hand, right? So I think you actually want that to happen. If they play Showdown, you actually want that to happen too, right? Imagine they just attack with Rubber. Uh, you get to block with Lost Track Beast, right? Because they have to basically suicide the rubber to play Shadow. They play Showdown. At the end of the turn, you can kill the Rimrock Knight. Uh, so their board is empty again. You get to attack with everything for seven and play Bone Crusher Giant. And now you have all this power in play. All they have is a Showdown. And then they're going to have more cards, but it doesn't really matter because you're just going to kill them, right? So I think in this scenario, you actively want them to attack and do either of these things, right? You, you don't have to prevent them from, from attacking with the robber. The only scenario you actually want to prevent is them attacking with the robber. You know, you eat it with the Lustrak Beast, and then they play something like Clarion Spirit plus a spell, right? So, for example, Clarion Spirit plus Frostbite would be a possibility, right? And, and that's a pretty bad scenario for you because you get to kill the Clarion Spirit with the Giant, right? That still, still works. But they basically uh, get a free 1-1 one -one Spirit out of the deal, right? That is the, the gist of it. That is the worst case scenario is that Instead of killing the, the robber, you kill the spirit, the current spirit, and they get a one spirit of it. Because they have to suicide the robber to get to, to trigger the, the current spirit, right? Mm -hmm. So it's there are three different sequences here. And I think two of them you're really happy, and one of them you're slightly unhappy. So most of the time I would say that you, you shouldn't give your opponent the, the choice, right? Because if if they are going to play Clarion Spirit, that's the worst that could happen for you. It is worse for you than just killing the robber outright, right? So given that the, the worst thing they can do for you is preventable, you should just do that. But I think odds are that they do something else mm -hmm. uh, by enough that it's worthless letting them attack, right? I think, you know, if they attack, you were working with uh, three different possibilities, and I think two are much more likely than the other. It is a weird play to attack with Robert just to upgrade Robert into a Clarion Spirit. Uh -huh. right? It's not necessarily a bad play, but it is slightly weird given the, the potential other plays your opponent might have. Right? So it, it's much more appealing to just play the Embercleave because you're not necessarily representing Giant Killer. Right? As I mentioned, they know you have red because you revealed this showdown, but they might not even have figured out what's going on. Uh, they, they probably are, but they don't know you have Giant Killer because the pause they're getting a pause, but it could be just because of the Fable Passage. Yeah. Right. So you're you're not necessarily representing this giant killer. Oh, sorry, this bone crusher giant. Mm -hmm. Uh. So they might just go for it, and they might feel like their best chance is to just play Embercleave. And if they do that, I think you just win the game. So, I think you're you're in a fine spot either way. But I would probably let them attack, and and then you know I I will deal with the scenario that is slightly worse, which is them playing the Clarion Spirit and something else, and because it gives me the chance to get the two great scenarios that I want which are them playing a showdown or Embercleave. And of course, they could just play nothing, right? They could not attack and then just do whatever they did. And then you can go to Kershaja and the robber anyway. So you can't force them into a bad play. But I believe there's a, enough of a likelihood that they make the bad play that you should let them. Does that make sense? It does. It's difficult to... I, I think that I don't know if I was very convoluted. Oh no, I thought it was a really good explanation. Uh, I I was going to say what's difficult is there there's something about robber of the rich like getting more triggers and casting your spells that is like it it, it nags at you at at your the inside of one's mind sometimes. <laughs> and so going past like allowing that to happen is sometimes 
might get to me or it might get to another player if that makes sense but i like that when you think it all the way through yeah maybe we want the robber to attack because it leads us to a happy place yeah it, it is a bit dangerous if they hit something you know if they could attack and hit a giant killer for example that would be pretty bad for you right but you will have two giant killers already uh and I don't know, there is a chance that it, it doesn't work out very well for you because, you know, they lose the robber, but they get to play Clarion Spirit and whatever else they stole. So it might not be worth it. I think it's a really close play. Okay. And it might be a play that I'll make or not make, depending on how good I think my opponent is. Because in the end, you are giving your opponent a choice, right? Uh, because they always have the choice to not attack. So you're, you're telling them, you do whatever is best for you. Okay. But you know that they don't have all the information that you have. Right. This is the scenario which is okay to do that. It's when you believe you have more information. And you do. You have this Bone Crusher Giant that they don't know about. Right? And, and that's the key card. So they might make a choice, uh, not knowing or not assuming you have Bone Crusher Giant, and then it's going to be a disaster for them. But it, honestly, it might not be worth uh, letting them attack and steal something great because you're in a great spot no matter what. So I think it's a close play. It really depends on what, what you think they're going to do and... It's, it's it's tricky because you know a lot of the time if they don't have anything to play they're not going to attack with the robber to upgrade it into a clarion spirit plus the chance to get something and sometimes they will right uh yeah. so it's it's really tricky basically i think uh it's it's a close play and i don't think what you did is necessarily wrong but i think it's worth thinking about yeah it is. is that clarion spirit because you, you mentioned the showdown, right? You, you said specifically what, what triggered this whole explanation was that you said we can't let them play our showdown, right? When you when you, you kill that. And I think the showdown is not your problem. The Clarion Spirit is your problem. So if they only had the showdown there, I would 100% let them attack. But because I think the showdown is not a problem. But because they have the Clarion Spirit, then you might want to kill it. But I do think it's worth thinking about, even if the choice is very close in the end. Okay. So yeah, a lot of, like, what I think is interesting is that we talk about the thought process mm -hmm. on the decisions, because the exact same decisions are not going to come up again, right? So in the end, you know, this play it was the best play versus this play was not the best play is not as important as understanding what you have to think about Yeah. when that, you're making the play. Yeah, that I was basically because that's, tunnel visioned on the showdown, right? Like, that's something I, I could should definitely do better, because the showdown wouldn't even be that bad for me. I know, I would say this showdown will actively be good for you. Right? You, you, if you could force your opponent to do that, you would. Mm -hmm. right? But there's a chance that they don't do that. So it's, it's tricky, but I think it's worth thinking about. That's really cool. That's really cool. Uh, the next play is, I think, the, the probably the... So they play the, they don't attack, they play the Torbrand, and then you have probably the hardest play of the match, I think, uh, it, which is this turn right here. So you have a lot of different choices, right, uh, in, in this spot. And I, do, I honestly don't think this is a play that you can fully figure out in the time that you have playing a match. So you have to kind of shortcut some things, right? And the first thing that I would shortcut is I'm looking at this spot and I'm thinking, I can't lose unless there's a disaster gonna have, that, that, that's going to happen, right? I, I'm, I'm in a very favorable position. Therefore, my instinct should be to sit back. Okay. Right. Uh, bec so this is the the first thing that that I would do when looking at this scenario. Right. Is is understanding if I need to be aggressive or if I can just sit back and try not to die. And I think this is the case here. So I think that kind of already rules out attacking uh, this turn because I don't think you need to do that. And right? I think you can just sit back and eventually you're just going to overpower your opponent. You can you know you can even draw three cards this turn if you want by playing all the adventure features. So the, the main thing here is not dying, right? I, how do I not die is basically my, my thought process here. And the play that you made, so you decided to attack, and then you were going to you tap the Thorbrand, and you, you blocked them in right now when they attack. If you had Embercleave, you would be able to Giant Killer it, right? But mm -hmm. I think this play has, uh, it has some glaring weaknesses. Uh, the first one is that it absolutely telegraphs the Giant Killer. Because you have a Bone Crusher that you could have played, and you didn't, right? When you have an Innkeeper in play, and you pass your three mana with three cards in hand. So your opponent has to know you have Giant Killer. So even if they have Embercleave, they're never going to play it. 
right? In, in fact, if you go uh, you know further in the match, you see that at this point in time, their hand is actually land Embercleave. Uh, and they didn't play it, right? Because it was telegraphed that you had giant killers. So you're never going to get them in a spot like that, right? Which maybe is fine, but it is a strike against the play. Mm -hmm. The second problem is that uh, you are putting yourself in a spot where next turn is going to be the same, but slightly worse for you, right? Because in this spot, uh, you know, what happened? Your opponent attacked with the Rimrock Knight. Uh, you, you blocked with the Innkeeper. You can't take five, right? Uh, and then now you lost your Innkeeper. So you're not going to be drawing more cards, and your Luster Beast can't even attack anymore. So you made a play that, you know, you, you were aggressive for a turn, which was to attack with the 5-5. Five five, but knowing that the path you took made it impossible to continue being aggressive. Because by losing your wrong one, your 5-5 five five can't attack anymore. So you have no, no more aggression. So you basically took your opponent from 17 to 12, but there's no prospect of you dealing the last 12 points of damage. Right? You, you could only be aggressive that turn. <laughs> my, do you get what i'm saying oh yeah my fans my fans so, are gonna... am i being overly harsh <laughs> no 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 but, it's great it's great because my fans you know, always make fun of me for being bad at aggro like this is perfect this is perfect cgb aggro we can only do it for a turn okay <laughs> okay go yeah, on yeah but you get what i'm, I'm saying right i you get it yeah you can't continue the aggressiveness oh yeah yeah I can't because believe you're forced I did to that oh man <laughs> And then your opponent has another Rimrock Knight. So the, the, the end scenario is, you know, this next turn is going to be the exact same as the previous turn, except you're down the Innkeeper. That's literally the only thing that changed, right? So you made a play that was not great, but it, it's setting up for the exact same play, but worse to happen next turn. Because next turn, you're going to have the same decision, right? Nothing changed. Your opponent still has the Torbrand and the Rimrock Knight. If they had Ember Cleaving Hand, they still have it. And they, it just gives them more turns to find the land or the Amber Cliff, right? Uh, so, but you can't close out the game. Like, you understand, you understood correctly that you had to, you know, you couldn't just sit back and do nothing because then you die to the Amber Cliff. But then your conclusion for that was, I can't sit back and do nothing, therefore I have to kill my opponent. Uh, but you couldn't kill your opponent. The correct conclusion should have been, I can't sit back and do nothing, therefore I should make my battlefield so strong that it doesn't matter if my opponent has the Ember Cleave. Okay. Right. So your your route to winning this game, like to you know, this is a you know who is the beatdown spot, right? You have to be the beatdown in the sense that you have to make something happen. But this something happen doesn't mean you have to kill them. It just means you have to grow your advantage to a point that is so unassailable that it doesn't matter what they do. Got it. So what, and, what, and that what was the play that turn? Do you think? Okay. So that's. It. Yeah, that's harder uh, <laughs> because I think, you know, identifying the two things that are important to identify are I, I don't have to attack because I'm winning. I think mm -hmm. that's number one. And number two is attacking will just lead me to the same spot next turn, but worse. Right. I think these are the, the two things that you have to identify. And these are the two things that I think you have time to identify during the match. Right? And after that, the permutations get a little complicated. Uh, I, I thought more about it. I even talked to some people about this particular scenario. And I think there are two possible plays that you can make. Uh, one possible play is you play Bone Crusher Giant, and you pass with two mana up, and you don't attack with anything. And then when they go to attack, you can tap the Torbrand. So if they don't have a land, then they can't even play Embercleave, right? And then you're fine. But let's assume that they do have uh, land Embercleave, right? So if you, if you pass the turn, uh, so you tap the Torbrand, and then they attack with Umbrug Knight. Then you can double block with Lustric Beast and Bone Crusher Giant, right? And then they'll kill both your creatures, but I think that's fine. Because you're still, you're going to draw an extra card this turn. Then next turn, you can, you know, potentially uh, uh, do tap their one creature that they're going to have in play. And at yeah. some point, you're going to draw something that is not a human to, to put the... Like you to put the gem razor on yep. and destroy the amber cliff. So I think that is one potential play that you can make. So again, just play Bone Crusher Giant, draw a card, pass, tap the Torbren, let them attack and double block. So you lose material, right? You lose two creatures and they only lose one, but that's fine. All you want to do is not die. And this play has the advantage of that if they don't draw, uh, they have one card in hand, right? If they don't have land plus amber cliff as their two cards, then you're fine. Right, but even if they do have that, um, you're still okay, 
So this play, at least you're advancing your board, because in the other scenario, what happened was they didn't play in Brickleven land, uh, even though they had it, they chose not to play it, and you didn't, you basically wasted your turn. Yep. Right? Yep. Uh, but if you make the play that I suggested, if they don't do anything, you'd have advanced your board by playing a giant and by drawing a card from the innkeeper. So it puts you in a much better spot if nothing happens, and it puts you in an okay spot if something happens. The other play that you can make is play Bone Crusher Giant, play two giant killers. Right, so you just have this whole field battlefield of creatures, uh, and you're going to draw three cards this turn because you're going to play three adventure creatures, and then uh, you pass the turn where you don't attack. And what do they do if they if they don't have Embercleave, they can't attack. If they do have Embercleave, they have to they'll, they'll attack with both their creatures, and then you have to block enough that you don't die to stomp the next turn. I think this should be your main consideration, mm -hmm. uh, which means if you do the math, uh, you know the Ring Rock Knight plus Embercleave. Uh, is 12 damage, right? We have the Torbrand. And the Torbrand plus Embercleave is 10. But if the Torbrand lives, the Stomp is 4 uh, instead of 2 for next turn. So it's it's basically the, the same math, which means you have to put 6 Toughness in front of each of the creatures. Right? So you can put 6 Toughness, you can block with Lustric Beast plus Giant Killer on the Torbrand, for example. Mm -hmm. And, sorry, Lustric Beast plus Bone Crusher Giant, not plus Giant Killer. Okay. Uh, and then... you. I, I confused these two names because they both have giant in them. Got it. But, and you can put the three giant killers, the three one twos, in front of the Rimrock Knight, which is six toughness as well. Right. So the most damage your opponent can do uh, is they can put you to, uh, you know, they'll deal, they will deal uh, 12 damage, you absorb six, you go to three, but Torben will die. Right. So Stomp is no, no longer lethal the following turn. Yep. Or Torben will live, but you'll be at five. Okay. Like that th those are the the scenarios that you're working with, uh, and I think both of those are okay. Uh, the downside between from this play to the other play is that they don't need the land; they only need the Embercleave. But if they don't have the Embercleave, you you just win the game for sure, okay. right? Uh, so it's not it's not clear to me which of the two plays is better. Uh, then you start having to permutate, you know, other things in the future, because if your opponent Embercleaves the Rimrock Knight, they kill your three giant killers. Right, you don't really want to lose the three giant killers. Uh, you you would rather you would much rather keep one giant killer in play so you can tap the Embercleave creature. Uh, but if they do that, then they don't uh, get to kill both your Lustric Beast and your Bone Crusher Giant, which means you get a target for the Gem Razor to kill the Embercleave, but then you can die to another Embercleave. So it, it becomes pretty complicated after that. And I honestly don't know which play is better, but I believe both plays are significantly better than, than the play that you made. I agree. I definitely agree. <laughs> so, yeah, this is basically all this convoluted thing to say that I don't know what the answer is or what the right play is, right? But I, I do strongly believe that it involves not attacking and just trying to advance your battlefield at least a little bit. I love it. I not I I also am not sure what the right play was, but that was definitely not it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we can go to the yeah, next Yeah, and slide. again, you know, yeah, the same situation is never going to happen exactly the same, right? Yeah. So it doesn't really matter what the right play was, just what you sh should be thinking about. Your sideboarding, I think, was pretty good. You you mentioned some doubt about it, but I think it's right to just take out some of the expensive cards. Right? You don't you don't win this this matchup with expensive cards alone. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't need them, right? Your your cheap stuff is big enough. Yeah. Uh, so forty one thirty nine. Let me find when I go there. Here on turn two, uh, I thought uh, your play was good as well. You you can play the Scavenging News or the Clarion Spirit, uh, and you chose to play the Clarion Spirit, and I think that makes a lot of sense because for two two reasons. First, the Clarion Spirit is more threatening, right? So it's not going to be good for you because you can't trigger it, but your opponent doesn't know that. So if they have the choice between playing their own creature or killing the Clarion Spirit, they might kill the Clarion Spirit because of how threatening it is, and you you'd prefer they did that. Right, that's reason number one. And the second is that the scavenge music is just more valuable for you, uh, mm -hmm. even though it might not look that way. So if they do kill the spirit, you get to play the ooze and, and use it, uh, and hopefully it grows big enough. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I like that play. Uh, then there is 49.39. Sorry. All right, jumping forward a bit. Let's see. Uh, 
Uh, here you they attack and you block both creatures, right? I think in a spot like this, I would probably just block the robber and not block the charger. Uh, because what you do by blocking the charger is basically you shrink annex by one, right? Uh, you don't remove a creature from play because the annex is there, so they're they're still gonna get a one one. Uh, and I just don't know if you're very interested in that, but I think it's close because I, from this perspective, I think if they have Embercleave, you're in a pretty bad spot anyway. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if the Anax is, you know, six power double striker or five power double striker at that point. Uh, it's not going to make that big a difference. Uh, so I would probably not have blocked this, but I also think it's it's close. Okay. Um, and then the next interesting decision is I think actually your opponent's decision is from forty seven twenty. Uh, and then your opponent just plays Stomp on your Spirit, uh, right, uh, before you can even attack. And your opponent should just let you attack. Because what they did was they gave you two valuable pieces of information, right? That they were going to kill your creature, and that they for sure had another creature to play uh, next turn. The Bone Crusher Giant, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and there's no reason to do this pre-combat unless they're going to kill the 1-1. One -one. Right? If they kill the 1-1, one -one, then you can't attack with the Lost Strike Beast, and that's a reason to do free combat. But if you're going to kill the 2-2, two -two, then there's no reason to do that. Right? Uh, and I think if they don't do that, you probably just want to attack with your Lost Strike Beast as well. And you might, even with them doing that, you might still want to attack with the Lost Strike Beast. Uh, even though you can't kill them next turn, it, I don't think it's possible that you kill them next turn, um, re very realistically. But like in, in this spot, it just doesn't look like you are going to win if you don't this is kind of like the reverse of the other spot, right? The other spot was you're winning, so all you have to do is not lose. This spot is you're losing. Next turn, you're going to give them back their annex, and then they're going to attack and kill you, right? And there's nothing in your hand that's going to change that. So you you try for a Hail Mary, right? You you attack, you do a lot of damage, uh, and then you try to win the game this way. So you can attack for 13 here. You can put them down to 7, and then maybe you end up in a spot where, you know, they have you attack with Lost Strike Beast, and they can block with the Anax, but they decide not to because they want to kill you with it. And you have another Bone Crusher Giant, and you kill them, right? It's it's a, a possibility of what can happen here. So, uh, or you know, you can include some uh, Gen Razor in, in in the mix, right? If you Gen Razor, you can kill the Anax maybe, and then they won't have blockers, then they'll die, uh, and stuff like that. So okay. I think it, you have to try to kill them somehow because there's not much in your deck that will even stop this from happening. Right, what they have in play is already enough to beat you. Uh huh. So I think you just have to be more aggressive and try to win. And it, as it turns out, you would not have won anyway. Right, but. But yeah, that's a good point. Um, I definitely could have. I I definitely should have. I think evaluated that I was further behind than I was. Yeah, because you know, it, the the Clone War is a pretty deceiving card, mm -hmm. right? Because it looks like you have so much, but yeah. it's all gonna flip on your next Justa. Yeah. Right. And there's really nothing you can do to prevent that. So it, it, it makes you look like you're in a better spot than you are. It's a pretty tricky card to play with. Understood. Um, yeah. So next, uh, your turn one. I think turn one is also interesting. I do agree that you probably uh, want to play the edge wall here. You know, there's some merit to holding it to make a token later on. But I think you're fine if they kill it, and people tend to kill that creature on site, and it will grow the ooze, and you just get more stuff in play. So I think it's okay to play it. Uh, the turn two is a turn I don't like very much, because okay. here you play Clarion Spirit on two, right? Uh, but then your turn three is just not going to be very good. You're going to play one creature, and that's it, right? You're not going to be able to, to trigger the Clarion Spirit. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you were going to play Clarion Spirit on turn two, you should hold the edge roll and keep her on, so you can play it on turn three and get an extra token, I, I, I think. Uh, but the... The better play here, I think, is just playing the Florahedron, right? Because if you play the Florahedron, this means you have four mana for next turn. The next turn, you can go Spirit plus Ooze, uh, and you get a token. Mm -hmm. So it's basically the same thing as playing the Sentinel on turn one, right? The, that other game. You play the mana creature first, because then you get to use the mana sooner, and you, you advance your position more. And in this case, it means that you're just going to get more stuff in play, and you're going to trigger the Clarion Spirit. So it's like two, two wins. Uh, plus, the Florahedrum is somewhat of a threatening card, right? Uh, it's not good for you here. You only have the mana to use it once. Uh, you only have stuff to cast once. So you're not accelerating much, but it is threatening, so they could kill it, right? You would much rather they kill the Florahedrum than they kill the Aquarian Spirit with a hand like this. So it's both better if it lives and better if it dies, 
than the clarion spirit Makes right sense. so i think yeah. it, you just played uh sooner uh and i think past that uh everything was pretty straightforward other than at the very end um let me see yeah, I, I remember this game spiraling pretty bad and drawing a bunch of clunky stuff. Main, mainly not yeah, being I able mean, to kill an annex, I think. Yeah, their annex was really the the card that uh, you know ruined everything for you. I think here you should have played Giganta instead okay. of playing Tosky, but I don't really think it, it matters for anything, so I don't know why I didn't mention it. You're, you're pretty dead here. There's nothing that you can really do. So, yeah, I think that was uh, that's about it for the things that I have. I think the, again, the key part was probably that attack with the Lustric Beast, which I think was very interesting to talk about, even mm -hmm. if I don't know what the right solution is, uh, right? And in general, the, the playing the mana creatures first, mm -hmm. I think because it's something that happened twice, right? Uh, you should almost, this is, I, I think, a pretty reasonable framework that you should play the mana creatures first, right? Because then you get to use the mana and they pay for themselves, right? So if you play the, you know, if you play the Lenore Elves on turn one, uh, it will pay for itself on turn two. You'll play whatever you could have played on turn one instead for free on turn two. Right? It's the same with the Sentinel. It's the same with the Florahedron. Right? You should just get them into play sooner than you you are. But yeah. other than that, I thought you know I thought you did pretty well, uh, honestly, uh, because you're thinking about a lot of in the same spots that I'm thinking. So there are a bunch of spots where I think this is complicated, and I'm sorry, thinking what can my opponent do? And you are thinking that, right? You're you're even saying it out loud. Which I think is harder to do when you're streaming. Uh, it's it's harder to be thinking and and talking about the same time. At least for me, it's much harder when you're it, recording a video or, or streaming. It. Yeah, it's hard. Uh, <laughs> it's very yeah. hard. <laughs> and but you're always like, okay, so here they can have you know frostbite, but they can't have this other card, or they can have this, and if they attack, they'll play my showdown and stuff like that. I think this is very important to do uh, to consider what your opponent can do and what they're thinking. So I think you were doing that pretty well. Uh, so I was actually pretty impressed. Thank you. That means uh, a lot. I'm, I'm going to try to not let that go to my head. <laughs> 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 That's really nice. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for checking out the video. Uh, hopefully I'll get to do better next time around. Uh, I appreciate that. So, yeah, that's at least going to wrap up the game review portion. And, um, yeah. Here we go, right? You're gonna you're gonna test my metal a little bit. Play some, <laughs> see see if I've learned any good lessons here. <laughs> Did the challenge come through? Yes. Okay. It's best of one, right? Yep. Okay. I am the one in best of one. You you have to put up with a little best of one from me, just a little. That's good. That's good for mono red. <laughs> it is good for mono red. It is good for mono red. All right. So this wasn't the deck that I played in the video today, but if I get to choose one deck to battle with against <laughs> the greatest in the world, the world champion, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick my favorite. Wait, I don't get to know what it is. It 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 it's, it's got a Yorian. Do you need a lot more? Okay, so um, you know what I play. It, that that is totally fair. Okay, it is. Well, it's not a meta deck either. <laughs> it's, oh, okay. It's... Then let's let's keep it a surprise then. All right. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll just kill you before it matters. Yeah, that's probably what's going to happen. To be honest. All right, courtesy Fable Passage Crack. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> That's going to punish you, too, because oh, I play yeah. a robber, and I'm less likely to hit a land. Oh, no. That is true. But the shuffler strikes again. <laughs> we have a song here. Uh, it's called the Mono Red Song, and it goes, Fervent champion, robber of the rich. This is mono red attack face till they're dead. I'm working on the on recording the hit single. It'll be coming out soon. <laughs> It'll be a huge success. Oh man! All right, I get to be lucky. <laughs> Eighty cards did it. <laughs> oh no! I don't like where this is going.
Okay, okay. Torbran. Ugh, I don't like him. I don't like him. <laughs> okay. Annex, definitely one of my arch nemesis. <laughs> it is very good. What am I supposed to do here? Hmm. Hmm. I got weird decisions, but I think they're all okay. So what do you have? What do you have? Another Torbran. I have a shark token. Okay. I have a book. I've got a I've got a book to read. Hmm. So let's see, worst case scenario. Ember Cleave is turned on here. Pretty brutal. And I take a lot of damage. Okay, this is a tough one. Let's see. Let's see. I think I'm going to force you to have the land and the sword, and we'll see how it works out. You missed a land drop earlier. Mm-hmm. Um. Oof. That's a lot of damage. That's a lot of damage. Yeah, is enough damage? It might be. It's it's scary. <laughs> All right, I'm keeping this card. Birds. Now we're back in Embercleave land. Okay. So some interesting timing things here because you can you can really mess me up i think we do it like this oh, please let me hit a counter spell i i i think i have to play around that but <laughs> I, I can do this and at least try to have a look oh my gosh yeah that that would have been bad <laughs> And I guess I play this now, since I don't know you could still hit some kind of counter. Oh, that's what's going on. Vanish into Fable. Oh, and I didn't even get a trigger. Whoa. Oh, yeah, because now you have two more cards in hand. Yeah, that even the trigger. That didn't even occur to me.
All right, I'm sending the knights. Not looking great. <laughs> it was a really good draw. Um, it was a really good draw on my side. But... I could have maybe played around this Shark Typhoon by not playing the Turbrand. I had the Frostbite, but... Oh, yeah. That was one of the more interesting ones. Yeah, I wasn't... I didn't really know what you had over there, so... It, it, the card... I didn't think, like... Because you had Yorion, and I didn't think that would that meant you, you played Shark Typhoon, but... Yeah, it's a bizarre yeah. Yorian deck for sure. It's a bizarre one. And it, right. like I drew really well considering it was against Mono Red. I like that. <laughs> I, I turned to Doomscar. <laughs> so pretty for you know, pretty lucky on, on that on that end. Very lucky. All right, I am oh, I had a pretty good draw too. It just didn't work out in the end. Alright, I'm defeated. Thanks for the game. Appreciate it a lot. Yeah, thank you. And we are back for the post-game wrap-up. And if you enjoyed that last deck list, it will be a future video, so don't bother asking me for the deck list right now. It's coming. Subscribe. It will be here soon. And wow. Um I am so I I am still just kind of glowing and so excited that I got to do this. I've been watching I've been watching Paulo since around the time he started. He started playing competitive magic on the pro scene in about 2003. In about 2005 was my last push where I did my best to compete on a professional level. And since then, I've been mostly watching magic, watching the pro scene as a spectator. And Paulo has like year after year after year with amazing consistency, played decks and uh, played uh, just amazing plays on camera, unbelievable moments from Pro Tours. Like, he's he's one player that I love to share the most, and it's kind of been awesome to watch from afar his journey as he has become, I think, widely considered the best player in the game and your current world champion. And the fact that he was able to make time for me uh, today uh, and help me work on my game and do this collab, I honestly believe truly it's because of you you guys you guys going to his youtube channel and leaving comments on his videos that cgb sent me when i did a shout out a little while ago i think opened this door and that's why you're the best thing about this channel so um sincerely i couldn't do this outro without thanking all of you uh, the cgb universe for the opportunity I appreciate it so much. Thank you to Paulo for your time and for sharing your competitive journey. It's been such a pleasure to watch for so many years. And if you guys take one thing away from this video, please go hit subscribe on Paulo's YouTube. Uh, PVDDR on YouTube, competitive magic. Uh, watch one of these videos all the way through. In every single one, you'll find something that can help you get better at this game that we all love. And I think that that's totally worth it. Leave a comment if you want to that CGB sent you. Obviously, that helped me get to this place. So it means a lot to me. Thank you. And if you want to get really serious, if you want to take it to the next, next level, go uh, at PVDDR on Twitter. Send a DM. Uh, let him know that you're serious about coaching. Let him know that CGB sent you. And if you get some coaching lessons and they turn out well and you go on to be this great, amazing player, you can maybe mentioned that today's video helped open the door it would be pretty cool to see one of the cool kids as the world champion one day and on that note you can also check out paulo as a writer for star city games he currently plays for the esports team tempo storm and if you do one thing check out a video thank you for watching this video as always i'll see you in the next video you're cool <laughs>